Well, you just ask the questions and <laughs> well, this, I can give the answer. The first one's real easy, just so I can get it on tape. Your, your name and the correct spelling of it. Well, my name is Stella Agnes Andrew Warner. And it's um, S-T-E-L-L-A, um, Agnes, A-G-N-E-S, Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W. That was the name of my first husband. And my last name, W-A-R-N-E-R. -E <coughs> yes. <coughs> and you were born in? England. W which part? Um, actually, on the border of Kent and Middlesex at a place called Plumstead and, uh, in 1921. So that makes me 81 years old now, doesn't it? <laughs> I've given that away right away. <laughs> um, yes, I lived there and my grandmother, my, um, my grandmother lived there, had a home there. And um, that was a few years after World War I that I was born. Um, and that was uh, before my, my father had fully decided what he was going to do. He was, my father was the paymaster at the Woolwich Arsenal, which was well known in England. Woolwich, it was a, a military base. He was in the army, but he got injured and his one wrist couldn't hold a rifle. So he was made a civilian, but worked for the Department of Army. And so they lived with my grandmother. So the first year or two, um, that's where, where I lived with my older sister and my mother and father. Okay. Then my father decided that uh, his hobby was photography. He was very interested in um, the Zeiss icon, which was German, you know, uh, cameras. And um, he was very interested in the technical side of photography. He was an amazing photographer. I have at home now a photograph that he took in 19, I think it was 1936, when the Queen Mary returned from her maiden voyage to the United States, he took this amazing picture of her coming into Southampton with a little sailboat and a tugboat and clouds and a beautiful picture. Well, anyway, I inherited that. I got that. didn't get much else, but I got that. And... Um, but anyway, he decided that's what he wanted to do. So he left us there, my mother and my sister and myself, uh, while he went down to the coast, were directly south from London. And, and when I'm talking about Plumstead, Kent, where I was born, it was actually also southeast London. And um, my... Um, my father thought wisely that probably a resort town would be a good place to develop a photographic business. He did. And he did all kinds of things. Uh, he photographed for the Temple and Breweries. Of the, you know, they're beautiful horses that they, they have here, or Budweiser has here. Well, that's, how, that's literally how they were pulling the uh, the, the Tamplin carts, uh, the beer carts, because they didn't have cars and all those kind of things. So anyway, he took photographs of that. He did some special request portraiture, but but he that was not what he liked to do. And he had one of the first movie home movie projector, silent movies, of course. But when I was a kid, a birthday party at our house was really something, and all my little friends loved to come because he would 
get films uh, from the film library about Felix and, uh, you know, and all of those, and Snub Pollard and B.B. Daniels and some of those real old timers, but, and show these um, movies. And so it was, was really great. And then he took a lot of home movies, too, of the family and... Uh, and then he, that's, he developed the business. Uh, he had a, quite a sizable business. He had a factory on one side, and then his equipment, which was his first love, cameras and equipment and lenses and all this different kind of um, material, photographic material, but he designed his own drying cupboard for films and printing equipment. And what he did, he had um, had a team of young boys, and that was before they had vans for business, you know. They, they had a team of boys, and one I always remember, they, he called lightning because he was so slow. But he would send them out, and in England, and in a resort town, the um, it was the chemist shops, like the drug stores, that took in the exposed film from customers. And they took them in and, uh, of course, registered them and, and, you know, everything. And then the, these boys would go on their bicycles with their canvas bags and pick up the film and deliver the ones that had been had been printed and so on, you know, had been uh, developed and printed. Okay. And I, uh, and then they would deliver them, so there was an exchange, and he had tremendous route um, doing that. And in the summertime, it was a very, very busy, very, very busy place. Um, every relative <laughs> I could think of, even a couple of years, all of us, there were six of us children, uh, the four older ones, I guess, uh, we all went down and help, helped out, you know, to do this. You had to stamp stuff with a number as it came in and so on, and then you all had to be ready to go at a certain time, and this boy went on this route, and this boy went on that route, and so on. But I have to share something with you that was one of the most like, <laughs> dramatic and humorous things that ever happened in one of those one of those summers. My mother, as a treat, we didn't often buy pastries at the bakers because my grandmother and my mother baked. I mean, I'm talking about this is after we moved to the south, after we moved to, to Brighton. And um, my father had drums that were this wide. I mean, he had one that was in use constantly, but it was like this wide. It was just polished, big heated drum, and then it was like a towel, a lintless towel that went through like this and came around over the top of the drum. This is how the prints were dried. So after the prints came out of the developer, they were in a tray, and it was somebody's job to sit there and slap these down on the towel, and it would go around, and then it would come down, it would dry, and then they'd all be sorted by number on the back and so on. Well, my younger brother um, was sitting, and my mother had delivered the basket of goodies, and he put this... He didn't think about it. He was sitting there at this roller, and he set um, a beautiful big jam cream puff on the thing, and it went around. And, and I, I've got a nose like a hawk. I smelled something that was almost like burning sugar. And I said to one of my dad's assistants, I said, do you smell something burning? He said, no, I don't think so. And then here it came over the top of the drive of the smack. And you know, it was fortunately, my dad did have one 
to fall back on, but it wasn't as efficient as this. But we thought my father would kill him, you know, because actually he was, he was pretty good about it, but we all just about died inside when that happened because that was, that was the worst thing that could have happened. But my dad, he paid us all generously. I mean, he just paid us wages. We thought we were in glory, you know. And, um, but it was a lot of fun. But um, I actually worked there less than my old assistant thing because uh, I was studying piano and had been for many years. And so I had to put in some practice time, you know, at home and, and everything. But anyway. That's just a little anecdote. And so that's where I grew up, right on the south coast. Um, spent most of my summers on the beach, in and out of the salt water, which of course the English Channel. And uh, life was uh, just pretty boring to me. I mean, I was ready for adventure. I always was. I was the rebel of the family. The only time I ever got to, but my father was a staunch um, conservative um, person. And the only time I ever voted, I voted liberal, just to be a rebel, you know, just to be a rebel. So I did that. But anyway, in 36, and things were pretty boring in any way, but then in the spring, of 39, very early in the spring, it must have been uh, January because my grandmother was still alive and still with us, and she died in March. They came around with the gas respirator, gas masks, respirators. And my grandmother, a very dignified lady, sat up very tall and said, I will never put on one of those ugly, ugly things on my head. I will never do it. They'll never make me do it. I'll die first, you know. And so she never did because she didn't have to. Uh, but everybody was given a respirator, gas mask, in a case. And then after that, no matter where you went, you were supposed to take that. And of course, in the service, we knew a lot of the girls took the gas masks out and used, those for, <laughs> used them for pocketbooks, you know. And um, so... By the way, this has been bothering me because I collect pennies, and I've been seeing that down on there and there. Okay. So anyway, um, that was the beginning of 39. In July of 39, I took my final music exams, which anyway, that was July. And then in September, well, it was about end of August, my girlfriend and I decided that we would, I mean, there, was rum, there were rumbles of war because all this political stuff with uh, all of the, the prime minister and everything was all going on, but nobody was really taking it too seriously. But we decided that if we were going to have to serve in one of the in one of the service organizations let's get the one where we like the uniform we like the air force blue better than the army khaki so that's what we did we joined um and we used to go once a month to the drill hall for drills and for lectures and this sort of thing until war was declared and i really except for music i really wasn't trained for anything my father Never, never even gave thought, and I don't know why that we would ever have to go out and earn our living, earn a living. You know, he never, he never, he didn't want any. In fact, my younger sister during the war, before she joined the land army, uh, she she worked, uh, she went to work in a very nice class. Um, chemist called Boots, very well known in England. And uh, my father was very much against that, did not shop, shop girl, that makes you a shop girl. You know, the two disparaging descriptions is shop girl or factory lass. You know, you didn't do that. So anyway, I, uh, you know, I, I was going to be a musician or teach music. That was fine, you know. So 
Anyway, my younger sister joined the land army. I was in the Air Force. My older sister was a nurse in the Air Force. My brother was in the army. Um, he was, um, in fact, he just died a couple of years ago. Um, he was sergeant major in the artillery, and he was taken prisoner by the Japanese at Singapore. And he was a prisoner of war in Japan for almost three years in um, Osaka and Nagasaki. And of course, that was a great, great worry to my mother. Um, I don't know if I'm sort of jumping the gun here, but anyway, I was, I'll go back to going in the service. And when you go in, you go in like you do in a big company. You go in at the lowest level. And uh, I didn't know a darn thing about cooking or anything like that. But they made me a corporal, and I was corporal in the cookhouse. Then I got the women's cookhouse. Then I was promoted to um, sergeant. Then I was sergeant in charge of the cookhouse. I still didn't know how to cook. I mean, it was just... Uh, um, you know, the cooking, it was pretty bad institutional type, you know. And uh, fortunately, I had the sergeant of the men's cookhouse to help me. Well, then I was promoted to flight sergeant. Now, it was while I was flight sergeant, the first place that I was sent, my first posting, was Tangmere on the south coast. Can you move around just for a second? I yeah. need to check one thing, because I think either my monitor is on that or... Yeah, yeah, it's just my monitor. Okay. Um, was a place called Tangmere. I've been back there several times, haven't been able to find it. It's been closed, and uh, there's no sign of it. But it is just a few miles east of Chichester. And it was just about... 21 miles along the coast from my home. And my parents, when we were very badly bombed in Tangmere, my parents could see the activity from where they were. I mean, they could see a lot of smoke and black smoke and stuff because it was right straight along the coast. And uh, we had it, it was fairly peaceful there. Um, now, this is in 1940. And um, in the beginning of 1940, we just did not have too much. We had reconnoitering planes coming over. And we had this, um, what they called a tannoy system on the base that, that broadcast uh, from headquarters so that if there were planes approaching, they would just say, uh, enemy planes at 30,000, 25,000 feet approaching from the southeast, uh, you know, take cover just calmly like that. Well, in August of 40, I was down at headquarters to ask the squadron leader of the base for permission to sell pig swill, which was stuff from the cookhouse to a local pig farmer and to use the money for uh, a, a party and a dance for the troops, you know, for the girls, for the girls and the fellow. And I was down there to see him. I remember him to this day. And so anyway, he said that was fine. And if I wanted, they called me Johnny because my last name was York Johnson and they called me Johnny. So that was fine, Johnny. If you want to do that, good luck, go for it, you know. So I, I just stepped out of there and there was this urgent message coming over the Tannoy system, not like it had been before, take how it said, Enemy planes approaching, take cover, take cover, take cover. Wherever you are, take cover, you know, so they knew they were bombers. So I was in a comparatively unknown part of the airdrome to me because I was down the headquarters 
I operated up on the hill on the women's mess, and our barracks were back in there. But anyway, I, I sort of started running north, and I saw this opening. And just as I was about to go in there, there was a terrible, I can't explain it, terrible explosion behind me, which I found out later was a hangar, a direct hit on a hangar. When, I came, when we came out afterwards, there were cars that were parked around there, were upside down on the, the top. The hangar was just upside down. I mean, it was just a terrible mess. But anyway, personally, I was lifted up physically and thrown into this air raid shelter. And there were others in there. And um, I remember my, this, this caused me to be claustrophobic for years, and I didn't realize it until I had it analyzed. But it was pitch black in there. And I'd come out of bright sunlight. This was August, the middle of the day. So you know it was bright outside. Thrown into this dark place. And I thought I was blind. I couldn't, because I couldn't see anything. I couldn't see anybody. And it didn't occur to me, you know, that, that it was because it was in like a cave-like setting. And this sergeant said, are you all right? Are you all right? Are you okay, sergeant? And I said, uh, where am I? I don't know. He said, well, you're okay. You're in an air raid shelter. Lean forward. Put your hands up over your head like this on your neck, like this. And he said, you got your respirator? I said, yes. He said, I think we might have to use them. Well, what had happened was there had been a direct hit on an oil barrel uh, by the parade ground, and the smoke and the vapors were coming that way, and they were getting the smoke, this, and they thought it was, they dropped gas bombs, but they, but it turned out not to be, but anyway, I always thought that um, I never truly recovered from that because um, it, it was at, behind me, it was at the back of me, and my children always knew never to come up behind me. Don't ever come up behind me and touch me because I, I might lose it, you know, because it was uh, such a terrific shock, like blast shock. But anyway, I mean, it didn't damage me as far as walking or anything like that until later on in life, I guess. But um, it was shortly, shortly thereafter. Well, OK, I better go back to the terrible damage that was done on, on our airdrome. First of all, the hangars were bombed. Planes were bombed, the Spitfires, emission, and um, well, OK, the other fighter planes they had were bombed right on the ground. And the parade ground was like a pebble beach. It had been severely bombed. And, you know, it was just turned up like up, like churned up. I mean, that's exactly what it looked like. The terrible thing was that um, I was uh, sort of, by that time, I was more an admin administrative NCO. And um, there was supposed to be some girls coming back on base, and they sent me, told me, to go down to the entrance of the base and um, make my way down there to make sure that the girls were all right that were coming on board. And when I got down there, I had to wait. And uh, one of the corporals that I knew really well from the cookhouse was there too. And he said, uh, oh, you heard what happened to Taffy? And I said, no, I haven't heard anything yet. Well, Taffy Lewis was a little, little guy that worked in the cookhouse, a little Welsh guy. And what happened was there, their shelter was under their mess, 
under the men's dining room, their mess, and all of the boiling water for the kitchen and everything that was needed there, all these big pipes, well, the pipe, they were down there and the pipes burst. He got scalded and killed in almost instantly. But anyway, they told me that's what happened to Taffy. But the horrible thing was, this is one of the bad memories. While I was down there, there were uh, Red Cross ambulance orderlies going around with sacks. And the bodies of people that had been killed, I mean, in the bombing, they couldn't tell who was who. So what they were doing was finding two arms, two legs, and a tag, putting those remains in, in the sack with a tag that represented that person. And so you, I'm sure it was horrible. And the other thing I remember, one of the German one of the German pilots who had bailed out with parachute had been, had been caught, and uh, they'd given him the job there with a shovel to clean the debris. And I will never forget, maybe it was just because of the emotional sensitivity I had for that time, but he seemed so arrogant. You know, of course, in 1940, he could afford to be because they thought they were going to win the war, you know. But I mean, he was just picking up a, one little stone at a time and tossing it over, and he had this sneer and grin on his face, if see what we can do kind of thing, you know. It was really bad. But anyway, uh, our barracks were smashed, and uh, so we had to be moved. So we made do for a couple of nights, and then the next thing we knew, we were being moved to a beautiful, beautiful house um, out of the highway east of the airdrome. And um, we moved in there, because all of the beautiful furnishings and pictures and everything had all been removed. You know, and the, the beautiful ballroom that had been the ballroom had beds in it, like dormitories, you know, for our, had, I remember it had 13 bathrooms in that place. And I, I went back looking for it, never found it. And I think it's because, you know, in like 40 or 50 years, things grow up around, you know, hedges and trees and things, and things change so much. But um, a few miles from our from our air airdrome, actually, uh, they had a dummy drone, which uh, was interesting. They had uh, wooden wooden aircraft. I mean, they weren't they couldn't have got off the ground if you put them on a catapult. You know, uh, they were wooden, and um, they were just. Uh, it was made to look like an operating base, you know, and it, of course it really wasn't. It was trying to divert them from Tangmere, you see. And then what other experience did I have there? The experience I had there was uh, that I attended the funeral of the first American that was shot down, marched, marched in the Guard of Honor for his funeral. And, you know, I regret this. But it was in the paper just, uh, I don't know when, but sometime in the early 60s, late 50s, early 60s, I saw this written up in the paper that they had brought his body back to the United States. And I felt like saying, I was there, you know, but of course I didn't. And, and somehow the paper got taken out to recycle and whatever, and I never, I never kept it. I did. Um, also, while I was there, um, there was a, a young officer on the base that I knew quite well, Doug Dale, his name was, and um, he got uh, shot up and came in 
at an angle and his plane, it had been raining only like it rains in England. I mean, the whole runway was just like a marsh. But anyway, his plane came in like at this angle and went right in, and of course he was killed. It was such a shame. And the evening before that happened, I had been in a pub with him, with his friend, and a friend of mine. I'd been playing the piano for them, and they'd been telling me, you know, teaching me songs that I didn't even, you know, I didn't even know, but I could pick them up real fast, you know. And we'd had a sing along, and, and it was real fun, but that was a bad shock. So anyway, that was really that experience there at that part. Then I got what we called posted, and that's when you get transferred, you know. I got posted to, now that was fighter command I was in there. That was the 11th group fighter command, saying there. I got sent. And what were you doing? What was your job there? Well, my job there was actually I was um, sergeant cook, but then I was flight sergeant administration. See, they promoted me, and uh, I switched over to admin because I want to get out of the cookhouse. And uh, so then they transferred me soon after I got my crown. The flight sergeant, the sergeant was three. Um, Chevrons, and flight sergeant who had a gold crown. That was the highest rank for a non-commissioned officer for the women. Shortly, not too long after that, they did make a warrant officers. And one of my best friends, who was a fellow sergeant, uh, she became a warrant officer. She thought it was terrible that I was commissioned, but anyway. I was sent to Curtin and Lindsay, Curtin and Lindsay, right up on the east coast, uh, close to Loughborough. It was a funny thing because I, you know, in those days and during the war, everything was so hush hush. I really wasn't too clear where I was. I knew, I knew I was east, and I didn't know if I was in Yorkshire or where I was. But anyway, uh, there. I had under me, I had uh, 500 air women and 14 NCOs. And I was top dog. I was a flight sergeant. And every morning I had to march them out on the parade ground, you know, for drill and flag salute and presentation to the officers and all this kind of stuff, you know. And then I did that, and then I also kept tab of all of their work schedules. You know, the girls that worked in the cookhouse, the girls that were the secretaries and the office workers and so on. And um, I, I, really, I really enjoyed that, and I liked the atmosphere very much of Bomber Command. Some of the Flying Tigers were there while I was there. One day, I remember this one plane with the tiger painted on the front. But anyway, and um, I don't know, there's a whole different attitude uh, in Bomber Command than either in fighter. You see, it's like having a football team. Your fighter command was sort of defensive. They were there to watch the planes coming across the channel They to defend, and they would go up and challenge the measure smiths and so on. But in Bomber Command, they were what they called the flyboys. And the flyboys, they were the aggressive ones that went out and did, did the damage. So anyway, um, that was 41, 40, beginning of 41. Well, I had only been up there about six months, and here orders came through, and I was caught. I was really surprised. I didn't know. But I had been called to London for interview for commission. So OK, off I went. I remember one of the women young officers there was really happy about it. But anyway, I went up there. I had to go before a board and answer questions and you know all this stuff. 
And anyway, then I got a letter, which is in my part of things, to say that I had been approved and I was on probation for so long and so on. Then I had to go to officers' training. So I went, um, it was at Loughborough, which was south of Curtin and Lindsay um, College. And uh, there were a lot of other young women there, you know, who were going to be officers. And um, we had to arrange to get our own uniforms. They made, gave us an allowance for uniforms and so on. We had our officers' uniform, you know, it was different, a little different from uh, just the general uh, issue, as we called it, that you got when you weren't commissioned. But anyway, but then the greatest disappointment of my life, when I got my posting papers of where I would go after I passed the officer's course, was North Wales. Well, for somebody that had been in activity, fire command, bomber command, everything going on, to send me to a place like North Wales, where there was nothing, the Germans didn't care about North Wales. They had a training station there close by where they trained men to fly to become pilots. And um, those young officers used to come over to see us in Pukhele, North Wales. Anyway, it was one of those young officers I met that I married. And it was Bob's dad. And um, we were married in, well, let me tell you about that. Pufeli was training command, the dullest. The dullest occupation, actually. They had a group of driver sergeant instructors who instructed girls to drive lorries, trucks, lorry trucks. And they would take them out at night. And it was a beautiful sight at night in Wales to see. I, I used to go ahead with a senior training officer, and we'd sit down in a pub down in the valley. And we would watch the convoys come over the, over the hill with the lights on. It was a beautiful sight, really. It was great. But it was so dull for me. I never learned to drive. I didn't learn to drive till I was 58. I was there in a training command. But uh, we took it in turns to drive uh, with the sergeant and with the girls. And of course, as administrative officer, we were on hand in case any of the girls needed anything. And you know, we took pretty good care of them and made sure the sergeants were behaving themselves. And, um, but that, you know, that was really, um, but, but, you know, now, I, at that time, was only, I became 21 while I was there. And it was a lot of responsibility. Um, the, the, the officers, the, the girls who were like my age, who were about four of us, we each took charge of one contingent. 500 came in every six weeks. 500 came in and 500 went out. And that each one of those was our responsibility. And so as they came in, we had to, they would all line up in the hall and we'd have to sit at the desk, check their papers as they came in, sign them off, and send them for what they called their FFI. That was free from infection, to make sure they weren't bringing any bugs in. But let me tell you, there were some brought in. And all the time, I had to have my leather gloves on. Well, I, oh, I picked up a nice dose of impetigo from one of those gals and had to be treated for that. But anyway, um, one, of, one of the gals, this ought, to, this ought to go down in, what is that book, Ripley's Believe It or Not? This one. Um, one of the gals was found to have scabies and impetigo and horrible things. And 
as they left, like me and the block, as they left the block, they had to go to sick quarters if there were, you know, to for the doctor to sign off on no infection. My poor doc, she really, you know, every time it was a bunch came in, she really had a job. But they had this gal who was raised in the slums of the East End of London, whose mother used to sew her underwear on her every, every fall, like about this time in the fall, and wouldn't let her take it off until spring. So you can imagine the condition <laughs> of that. And they had a struggle. It took three or four women to get those clothes off her, to cut them off her, and get her in the tub and scrub her, because scabies has to be scrubbed off, you know. And anyway, um, I, I just couldn't believe it. And, and Doc told me, she said, Johnny, you just, you, you just got to believe, you wouldn't believe this. She said, I didn't know we had anything like this in England. But she said, this mother must have been crazy in the head because she sewed these clothes on her and would not allow her to take them off until spring. So anyway, um, then Bob and I were married. Um, he had been an army officer, and he wanted to transfer into the Air Force because he had two brothers who were Air Force officers. There were three brothers, three Andrew brothers. There was uh, the oldest one, who was Doug, who was on heavy bombers, and um, flew from England, the East Coast, to into Germany, Berlin, Frankfurt, I mean, all the big German cities bombing. Then there was Phil, who was in Africa, in the African campaign that came up through Africa into Italy. He was the one that told me about those, um, land, those um, troops bailing out in the Met into the Mediterranean and didn't get to shore. It was, it was very bad. I mean, they... It's hard to imagine anything like that happening now, but they didn't have the instruments we have today to detect and see through fog and things like that. But anyway, Phil, um, yeah, Phil survived the war. Both of the, both of Bob's brothers were both decorated um, by the king for um, with a distinguished flying cross for their service. I mean, which is a great honor and. Somewhere, I don't know if I have them now or who has them. Somebody has pictures of them at the palace. But anyway, the, Bob was the middle one. He was the second to the eldest, and he was the, the middle one. And um, he, so he transferred to the Air Force from the Army, took his training, according to his buddy, who was his best man at our wedding, um, he, he just did brilliantly. And the reason was that he had done a lot of, he was going to be an architect, you see, and he'd already done some of this pre-work and in design and printing. He was just beautiful job on everything. So naturally he did very well. But anyway, the, the sad thing is at this point is that everybody, Everybody, with the exception, as far as I know, I haven't kept in touch with her, but every, everybody in our wedding party got killed in the war, except me and my sort of maid of honor. Our best man, Joey Bar Barker, was, he went the same time. And Bob, my husband, was flying Boston's up out of the East Coast. I don't know the station because on his letters he wasn't allowed to put the station. It was um, it was the Air Force Post Office box. You know, you didn't know. But anyway, um, he he was flying Boston's, and I think Joey was flying Boston's. And then my maid of honor's fiance, who was Polish, Air Force, uh, also was killed. And so I was the only, only one that survived. But um, 
Bob, my husband's death was not a nice, what you might say, a nice clean cut affair. They got it so fouled up, more ministry. We got letters and letters and letters. And after he was shot down, that uh, they mis mistaken identity, buried in the wrong grave, uh, f false reports from Dutch observers. Um, he's buried in Middlekirk Cemetery in Belgium. And it's, uh, it's just so, well, I don't do it anymore. It was so distressing to me at the time uh, to read, I, here, like in the mail, here comes another one, you know, another letter. Um, I became pregnant with Bob and in, um, we were, mar we were married in March of 42. It was sometime that summer. Bob was born in 43, just, uh, just a little less than a year after we were married. And so Bob never saw his father. His father never saw him. And the last time I saw his father, you know, he said, if anything happens to me, I want you to just go on and live a, a happy life and don't dwell on the past. And, you know, so I have done my best to do that, uh, putting so much of this stuff behind me and buried it very deeply in my mind that, um, you know, until I start working through a, a, a continuation of events, that's when, you know, it's, it's able. So anyway, my parents had a lovely, a lovely home. And um, when, I, when I got discharged from the service, uh, if you were pregnant or whatever they said, they called it, um, service is no longer required. Well, you can just imagine being pregnant marching, can't you? Anyway, um, I went home and I, so I lived with, stayed with my mother. But it was there um, in September, he was supposed to be coming home for his birthday. And um, I was, upstairs getting my my parents we had this one room excuse me i'm going to have to call <coughs> my my mother always kept this room she called it the the um the what do you call it the marriage boudoir my mother had a wonderful sense of humor, but you know, as her daughters came home with her husbands, you know, that was their room. So I was up there preparing the marriage boudoir for us. And here, a telegraph boy on the bicycle came up in the driveway. He came to the door. My mother was rooted to the spot. As I got to the door, I never forget this. I turned around and looked at her. She was as white as a sheet. And it suddenly occurred to me what she was thinking. My brother, see, in prison of war camp. And so it, was so it was so strange. Here I was pregnant, and I don't know. I just, this icy calmness. I went to the door, I took the telegram, I opened it. It said, I regret to inform you that your husband, you know, has been um, lost, believe, missing, believe, dead, and so on. I turned around, I thought my mother was going to faint, and I said, Mama, it's, it's okay, it, it, it's Bob. It isn't Dennis, it's Bob, see, because she, that's right. And so she, then she came towards me and we hugged. And then she disappeared and I knew what she had done. She um, had gone over to the neighbor's house to call my father because she didn't want me to hear a telephone conversation with him. 
So she called my father and told him, you know, that this had happened. Skip, do you want to grab me? The monitor went out. Do you want to bring a new monitor over? There? It's power. Huh? It's power went away. No, it's, 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 yeah, the monitor's. So the power's out. Oh. One lady, one Sorry. Lady. Um, now there's some irony here mm -hmm. in the fact that if I if my notes are right, it was September 27th. Mm -hmm. That's right. Which is today. That's right. That's right. Isn't that strange? It really is. And uh, it's uh, just um, it's a sort of an uncanny sort of sort of thing almost. But you know. Um, with Bob, uh, you know, I'm really glad now that I brought him to the States. I brought him to the States when he was um, four, almost five. I stayed on excellent relations with my husband's family, particularly his mother, who I called Mother A, because Mother Andrew, you know, she was a lovely, lovely lady. And Bob's death really contributed to the death of his father. His father had a heart attack. Bob was uh, kind of the shining, I don't know, his, he was tall and handsome. The other two boys were a little more, um, a little shorter, you know, but Bob was just like Bob, that build. But I, w I was always glad I did, but, uh, but you know, it's it's uh, really a strange thing that you should bring that up because I have always felt that Bob he's he's okay he's being taken care of he's being watched over his his dad is not going to let anything happen you know what I mean everything and you know it's weird it's weird because I touch, I, you haven't got any wood around here <laughs> but. <laughs> He's been very, very fortunate in everything he's done. And he's a good person. And he, just like his father, he's a very moral person. He's very um, family-oriented. And everything that he has turned his hand to, he has succeeded. And he deserves to. And he and Susan have been married 37 years now, and they deserve it. They were excellent parents, and their boys, their boys um, are just both wonderful boys and have made good marriages, and you know. How long do you know Bob's, your husband, before getting married? Um, four or five months. I suppose. Love at first sight? Um, I think it was with him. Um, I'm not quite sure because he kept coming back, but he was not a demonstrative person. In fact, I don't ever remember him actually proposing to me. I think I said to him, well, if I had my way now, uh, my, my way we'd be married. And I think I was sitting on his lap in the back of a car because we were all crammed in going someplace. And I think, I think that was it. And then um, <coughs> I kind of spoiled it for him because um, he was going to take me. And he did take me to a... He found there was a little Welsh bus that went down into the valley to this little sort of park-like place. And on the bus in his uniform, somehow I felt this lump, you know. Of course, it was the ring. I couldn't wait. I said, no, I want, I want to see it right now. I've got to see it. I've got to see it right now. Well, there were, there were no really good jewelers in North Wales. Flan Flandino was the closest, and they didn't have much. So he bought me a beautiful amethyst and white gold ring that was my birthstone. 
So that was my, and I've still got it, of course. That was my, uh, that was, I never did have a, have a diamond. But, um, you know, there's several sort of ironic things. You mentioning this about the 27th. Um, when, uh, soon after I got home, I went to visit his mother and his family. And while I was there, I was doing something and I went to put something in the drawer in off, off her sort of living room. <coughs> and the hook, hook of the, the drawer somehow caught my ring, my wedding ring, and ripped it off my finger and sent it flying. <gasps> She was so upset, and we couldn't find it for a while. And she didn't have too much to say. She said, no, I don't like that very much at all. But sometime later, of course, after Bob was killed and I told my mother what happened, she said, well, you know, there was a superstition about that. If the wedding ring got taken off the finger, you know, I mean, it used to be you got a wedding ring put on, that was forever. You know, you didn't take it off. But if it got ripped off, like this was an indication that something was going to happen. And of course, they were, all of the Andrew family were very good to Bob, naturally. And, um, but the other two boys, uh, his dad's brothers, only had daughters. So the, con the continue, continuity of the name rested with him. And I said, Bob, you've got to have boys. And he did. He had two boys. So that was great. So there's still Andrew. We, we, he, get, he always has to say, no S. Andrew, no S. No S. <laughs> but anyway, it's all worked out very well for for him and um, um, you know one question that a lot of students ask about World War II and, and being in the situation that that you were in is why get married I mean did you real did you discuss he was flying missions there were young men not coming back and a lot of kids today don't understand what or why, or they don't know what they would do in that situation. Well, um, yes, I I think that uh, I think that when things were serious as they were then, I think that you felt you wanted to live as much as you could in the presence and hope for the future, but not place too much hope on it, but to have what you wanted and do what you wanted and what you could. Uh, to me, uh, loving him and marrying him gave him something worthwhile. And I regret it very much now, but when my mother came to visit me in 1957, she brought a, a whole bundle of letters like this. And for me that he had written me and I told her I didn't want to read them because it would just bring all this back, all this. And, but anyway, um, he had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, and he and his brothers had a wonderful relationship. And I remember one outstanding thing in his letter that he said that I've often laughed about and I thought, I wonder how many women would see the funny side of it. But he wrote to his younger brother before he met me and said, she isn't an oil painting, but you're going to love her like I do. You know, and, I, and uh, first of all, that sort of hurt my feeling. I thought, I thought, you know, when you're young like that, you think, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You know, he's supposed to think that, but, but anyway. But um, no, and he knew I was pregnant, and that's why he wanted me to 
to, um, you know, just go ahead and be happy. And, and it, it's made a great difference in my life. Um, I feel that coming to the States was one of the best things I did because I wouldn't be here if I'd been in England. I know I would not have lived this long. And like I was in a lawyer's office yesterday and she said, good night. She said, Stella, how old are you? I said, I'm 81. She said, my, but you're well preserved. But I wouldn't have been had I been in England because I have had a lot, a lot of surgeries and uh, just come, you know, just come through them. And except for feeling tired, I have pretty much a routine now where all my bright stuff, writing letters and everything like that, is done in the mornings. In the afternoon, I nap. And then around 4 o'clock, then I revive. Then it's tea time. And then I revive, and then I'm good till 11 o'clock, and my husband would let me stay up. But anyway, um, of course, it was a sad thing for me that I was raised, what should I say, not exactly with a silver spoon in my mouth, but, but well, what's that, that little verse about sitting on a satin cushion, eating strawberries and cream? I mean, in my life, it, it never occurred to me I would have to ever go to work out. You know, um, in, at our level, we were, you know, there were so many class, we were like gentry. We weren't aristocracy. We weren't, you know, my father was a well-to-do merchant, okay, but he owned land, so that made him sort of like gentry. And, um, you know, usually uh, gentry, they, they, their hobbies were their life occupation. They either wrote or they rode horses and, and raised horses, or they um, were musicians or, you know, did... I mean, my parents would never have allowed me to go on the stage to be a which I had the opportunity, and that's what made me remember this. I had the chance when I was little, um, one of the women that used to come and help my mother um, had heard that, that to do the Christmas pantomime, they wanted ch children, you know, and uh, she thought I would do very well at it because I was musical and I had a good sense of rhythm and time and everything. Oh! My mother would not hear of it. No daughter of mine is going on the stage. I think that they were thinking too too much back into the Edwardian times, you know, when when um, some of the um, stage ladies were also mistresses of royalty, you know. But anyway, um, in England was like America. The woman's place in England, uh, the work environment was not the woman's place. That's right. So it was, World War II had some of the same effect in England as it had here. Oh, yes. It yes. opened a lot of doors. Oh, yes, it did. It did. And, you know, I hate to say this now because I didn't realize what a snobbish thing it was. But when I was in school, one of my friends mother's was a widow and she had to go out to work she had to go out to work I mean that was just horrible you know the idea of going out to work you know and uh, <laughs> strange thing is that her younger sister wound up marrying my brother so you know I mean it's um, it's a, it's a strange world but that certainly is is very is very true but I have to confide that um, I, I have strange feelings sometimes of not being right now in my right class. I mean, I don't know how to, ex how to describe it, but um, it was uh, it, sort of difficult. 
for me. I did go to work. I went back to school. I went to school here. I uh, took accounting and uh, um, secretarial skills like typing. Never could do shorthand, but did secretary other secretarial skills. And I always had good jobs. And um, after working 21 years for one company in town, I decided there was no future in it because there was no retirement, no pension or anything. So I decided to work for the state. Well, first of all, I got sort of temporary jobs. Uh, then I finally got a letter in the mail to go interview for um, business manager of the uh, Washington State Law Library, and that's where I wound up. Oh, really? Yes, oh. And that's where I, that was where I retired from. Let me, I, I have to switch tapes here. One moment, please. 